Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are ready to start Chapter 2 in Farmer Boy. If you're following along in the PDF file, it is called Winter Evening. If you have a physical copy of the book, it is page 13. Page 13. The air was still as ice and the twigs were snapping in the cold. A gray light came from the snow, but the shadows were gathering in the woods. It was dusk when Almanzo trudged up the last long slope to the farmhouse. He hurried behind Royal, who was hurried behind Mr. Corse. Alice walked fast behind Eliza Jane and the other sled track. They kept their mouths covered from the cold, and they did not say anything. The roof of the tall red-painted house was rounded with snow, and from all the eaves hung a fringe of great icicles. The front of the house was dark, but a sled track went to the big barns, and a path had been shoveled to the side door and a candlelight shone in the kitchen windows. Elmonzo did not go into the house. He gave the dinner pail to Alice, and he went to the barns with Royal. There were three long, enormous barns around three sides of a square barnyard. Altogether, they were the finest barns in that country. Elmonzo went first into the horse barn. It faced the house, and it was 100 feet long. The horse's row of box stalls was in the middle at one end of the calf shed and beyond it, the snug hen house. At the other end was the buggy house. It was so large that two buggies and the sleigh could be driven into it with plenty of room to unhitch the horses. The horses went from it into their stalls without going out again in the cold. The big barn began at the west end of the horse barn and made the west side of the barnyard. In the barn, big barn's middle was the big barn floor. Great doors opened onto it from the meadow and that to let loaded hay wagons in. On one side was the great hay barn bay, 50 feet long and 20 feet wide, crammed full of hay to the peak of the roof far overhead. Beyond the big barn floor were 14 stalls for cows and oxen. Beyond them was the machine shed and beyond it was the tool shed. There you turned the corner into the south barn. It was... In it was the feed room, then the hogs pens, then the calf pens, then the south barn floor. That was the threshing floor. It was even larger than the big barn floor and the fanning mill stood there. Beyond the south barn floor was a shed for the young cattle and beyond it was a sheep fold. That was all, that was all of the south barn. A tight board fence 12 feet high stood along the east side of the barnyard. The three huge barns and the fence walled in their snug yard. Winds howled and the snow beat against them, but it could not get in. No matter how stormy the winter, there was hardly ever more than two feet of snow in the sheltered barnyard. When Almanzo went into these great barns, he always went through the horse barn's little door. He loved horses. There they stood in their roomy box stalls, clean and sleek and gleaming brown with their long black manes and tails. The wise, sedate workhorses placidly munched hay. The three-year-olds put their noses together across the bars. They seemed to whisper together. Then softly their nostrils whooshed along one another's necks. One pretended to bite and they squealed and whirled and kicked in play. The old horses turned their heads and they looked like grandmothers at the young ones. But the colts ran about excited on their gangling legs and stared and wondered. They all knew Almanzo. Their ears picked up and their eyes shone softly when they saw him. The three-year-olds came eagerly and thrust their heads out to nuzzle him. Their noses prickled with a few stiff hairs were as soft as velvet, and on their foreheads the short, fine hair was silky smooth. Their necks arched proudly, firm and round, and the black manes fell over them like a heavy fringe. You could run your hand along those firm, curved necks in the warmth under the mane. But Almanzo hardly dared to do it. He was not allowed to touch the beautiful three-year-olds. He could not go into their stalls, not even to clean them. Father would not let him handle the young horse, horses or colts. Father didn't trust him yet because colts and young unbroken horses are very easily spoiled. A boy who didn't know any better might scare a young horse or tease it or even strike it, and that would ruin it. It would learn to kick and bite and hate people, and then it would never be a good horse. Remember back to Black Beauty, how Ginger was treated when she was young, the difference between how Ginger was treated and how Black Beauty was treated and how they grew up to be very different horses. Elmanzo did know better. He wouldn't ever scare or hurt one of those beautiful colts. 
He would always be quiet and gentle and patient. He wouldn't startle a coat or shout at it or even if it stepped on his foot. But father wouldn't believe this. So Almanzo could only look longingly at the eager three-year-olds. He just touched their velvety noses and then he went quickly away from them and put on his barn frock over his good school clothes. Father had already watered all of the stock and he was beginning to give them their grain. Royal and Almanzo took pitchforks and went from stall to stall, cleaning out the soiled hay underfoot and spreading fresh hay from the manger to make clean beds for the cows and the oxen and the calves and the sheep. They did not have to make beds for the hogs because hogs make their own beds and keep them clean. In the south barn, Almanzo's own little calves were in one stall. They came crowding each other at the bars when they saw him. Both calves were red and one had a white spot on his forehead. Almanzo had named him Star. The other was a bright red all over, and Almanzo had called him Bright. Star and Bright were young calves, not yet a year old. Their little horns had only begun to grow hard in the soft hair by their ears. Almanzo scratched around their little horns because calves like that. They pushed their moist, blunt noses between the bars and licked with their rough tongues. Almanzo took two carrots from the cow's feed box and snapped little pieces off them and fed the pieces one by one to Star and Bright. Then he took his pitchfork again and climbed into the hay mows overhead. It was dark there. Only a little light came from the pierced tin sides of the lantern hung in the alleyway below. Royal and Amanza were not allowed to take the lantern into the hay mows for fear of a fire. But in the moment, they could see in the dusk. They worked fast, pitching hay into the mangers below. Elmanzo could hear the crunching of all of the animals eating. The hay mows were warm with the warmth of the stock below, and the hay smelled dusty sweet. There was a smell, too, of the horses and the cows and a woolly smell of the sheep. And before the boys finished filling the mangers, there was the good smell of warm milk foaming into father's milk pail. Elmanzo took his own little milking stool and a pail and sat in Blossom's stall to milk her. His hands were not yet strong enough to milk a hard milker, but he could milk Blossom and Bossy. They were good old cows who gave down their milk easily and hardly ever switched a stinging tail into his eyes or upset the pail with a hind foot. He sat with the pail between his feet and milked steadily. Left, right, swish, swish, the streams of milk slanted into the pail while the cows licked up their grain and crunched their carrots. The barn cats curved their bodies against the corners of the stall, loudly purring. They were sleek and fat from eating mice. Every barn cat had large ears and a long tail, sure signs of a good mouser. Day and night, they patrolled the barns, keeping the mice and the rats from the feed bins, and at milking time, they lapped up pans of warm milk. When Almanzo had finished milking, he filled the pans for the cats. His father went into Blossom's stall with his own pail and stood and stool and sat down to strip the last richest drops of milk from Blossom's udder. But Almanzo had gotten it all. There is a picture of Almanzo milk in Blossom. Then father went into Bossy's stall and he came out at once and said, you're a good milker, son. Almanzo just turned around and kicked at the straw on the floor. He was too pleased to say anything. Now he could milk cows by himself. Father needn't strip them after him. Pretty soon he would be milking the hardest milkers. Almanzo's father had the pleasantest blue eyes that twinkled. He was a big man with long, soft brown beard and soft brown hair. His frock of brown wool hung on the top of his tall boots. The two fronts of it were crossed on his broad chest and belted snug under his waist, around his waist. Then the skirt of it hung down over his trousers of a good brown full cloth. Father was an important man. He had a good farm. He drove the best horses in that county. His word was as good as his bond, and every year he put money in the bank. When father drove into Malone, all the townspeople spoke to him respectfully. Royal came up with his milk pail and the lantern, and he said in a low voice, Father, Big Bill Ritchie came to school today. The holes in the tin lantern feckled everything with the little lights and the shadows. Elmanzo could see that father looked solemn. He stroked his beard and surely slowly shook his head. Almanzo waited anxiously, but father only took the lantern and made the last round of the barns to see that everything was snug for the night. Then he went to the house. The cold was cruel. The night was black and still, and the stars were tiny sparkles in the sky. Almanzo was glad to get into the big kitchen, warm with fire and candlelight. He was very hungry. 
Soft water from the rain barrel was warming on the stove. First father, then Royal, then Almanzo took his turn at the wa wash basin on the bench by the door. Almanzo wiped on the linen roller tower, then standing before the little mirror on the wall, he patted his wet hair and combed it smoothly down. The kitchen was full of hoop skirts balancing and swirling. Eliza Jane and Alice were hurrying to dish up supper. The salty brown smell of frying ham made Almanzo's stomach gnaw inside him. He stopped just a minute in the pantry door. Mother was straining the milk at the far end of the long pantry. Her back was toward him. The shelves on both sides were loaded with good things to eat. Big yellow cheeses were stacked there and large brown cakes of maple sugar, and there were crusty loaves of fresh baked bread and four large cakes and one whole shelf full of pies. One of the pies was cut and a little piece of crust was temptingly broken off. It would never be missed. Elmanzo hadn't even moved yet, but Eliza Jane cried out, Elmanzo, you stop that, mother. Mother didn't turn around. She said, leave it be, Elmanzo, you'll spoil your supper. That was so senseless that it made Elmanzo mad. One little bite couldn't spoil a supper. He was starving, and they wouldn't lead him, let him eat anything until they had put it all on the table. There wasn't any sense in it. But of course, he could not say this to mother. He had to obey her without a word. He stuck out his tongue at Eliza Jane, and she couldn't do anything. Her hands were full. Then he went quickly into the dining room. The lamplight was dazzling. By the square heating stove set in the wall, father was talking politics to Mr. Corse. Father's face was toward the supper table, and Almanzo dared not touch anything on it. There were slabs of tempting cheese. There was a plate of quivering head cheese. There were glasses, glass dishes of jams and jellies and preserves and a tall pitcher of milk and a steaming pan of baked beans with a crisp bit of pork fat in the crumbling brown crust. Elmanzo looked at them all and something twisted in his middle. He swallowed and he went slowly away. The dining room was pretty. There were green stripes and rows of tiny red flowers on the chocolate brown wallpaper and mother had woven the rag carpet to match. She had dyed the rags green and chocolate brown and woven them in strips with a tiny strip of red and white rags twisted between them. The tall corner cupboards were full of fascinating things, seashells and petrified wool and curious rocks and books. And over the center table hung an air castle. Alice had made it of clean yellow wheat straw set together airily with bits of bright colored cloth at the corners. It swayed and quivered in the slightest breeze of air and the lamplight ran gleaming along the golden straw. But to Almanzo, the most beautiful sight was his mother bringing in the big willow ware platter full of sizzling ham. Mother was short and plump and pretty. Her eyes were blue and her brown hair was like a bird's smooth wings. A row of little red buttons ran down the front of her dress of wine colored wool and from her flat white linen collar to the white apron tied around her west, waist. Her big sleeves hung like large red bells at either end of the blue pattern platter. She came through the doorway with a little pause and a tug because her hoop skirts were wider than the door. The smell of the ham was almost more than Elmanzo could bear. Mother set the platter on the table and she looked to see that everything was ready and the table properly set. She took off her apron and hung it in the kitchen. She waited until father had finished what he was saying to Mr. Corse, but at last she said, James, supper is ready. It seemed a long time before they were all in their places. Father sat at the head of the table, mother at the foot. They must all bow their heads while father asked God to bless the food. After that, there was a little pause before father unfolded his napkin and tucked it in the neckband of his frock. He began to fill the plates. First, he filled Mr. Corse's plate, then mother's, then Royal's and Eliza Jane's and Alice's. And then at last, he filled Almanzo's plate. Thank you, Almanzo said. Those were the only words he was allowed to speak at the table. Children must be seen and not heard. Father and mother and Mr. Corse could talk, but Royal and Eliza Jane and Alice and Almanzo must not say a word. Almanzo ate the sweet, mellow baked beans. He ate the bit of salt pork that melted like cream in his mouth. He ate mealy boiled potatoes with brown ham gravy, and he ate the ham. He bit deep into the velvety bread spread with sleek butter, and he ate the crisp golden crust. He demolished a tall heap of pale mashed turnips and a hill of stewed yellow pumpkins. 
And then he sighed and tucked his napkin deeper into the neckband of his red waist. And he ate plum preserves and strawberry jam and grape jelly and spiced watermelon rind pickles. He felt very comfortable inside. Slowly, he ate a large piece of pumpkin pie. He heard Father say to Mr. Course, the hard scrabble boys came to school today, Royal tells me. Yes, Mr. Course said. I hear they're saying they'll throw you out. Mr. Course said, I guess they'll be trying it. Father blew on the tea in his saucer and he tasted it and then drained the saucer and poured a little more tea into it. They have driven out two teachers, he said. Last year, they hurt Jonas Lane so bad he died of it later. I know, Mr. Course said. Jonas Lane and I went to school together. He was my friend. Father did not say any more. That is the end of that chapter. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about it. Uh, if you remember from what we read early in the chapter, uh, uh, how can you tell that father is a good father to his children? How can you tell that Almanzo's father is a good father to his children? Yes, he's very, he's kind to them and he teaches them things and he um, tries to get them to do the right thing. You can just tell that he's a good man, that children trust him and they love him. Why doesn't father trust Almanzo around the Colts? What does he think is going to happen? Yes, he thinks that Almanzo is going to scare the Colts or maybe treat them badly and it will ruin the Colts. That's what he thinks. Um, in this quote, let me find it first. The cold was cruel. What does that mean? The cold was cruel. The night was black and still, and the stars were tiny sparkles in the sky. Elmazo was glad to get into the big kitchen, warm with fire and candlelight. He was very hungry. What does it mean the cold was cruel? Yes, it means it's bitterly, bitterly cold, super cold outside, and it's not showing mercy on anybody. It's making everybody really cold and uncomfortable. In this chapter, we're introduced to Father, who is Mr. Wilder, and that's Elmando's hardworking and kind father. We're also introduced to Star and Bright. Those are the two young calves that Elmando cares for. And we are introduced to Elmando's mother, Mrs. Wilder. Okay, we have a couple of vocabulary words today. Let's go ahead and get out. Let me find it. Is this the pen I was using? I think so. Get out your interactive notebook. Um, I think I'm going to need a new page because I don't have enough room on my other one. So go ahead and put your heading on your paper, your name. The date, 2 17, 21. And the lesson is chapter 2. I'm just going to put 2. All right, our first vocabulary word is Eve. We use E A, -A to make the E sound. Eve. A part of a roof that extends out past the wall. Say it. A part of the roof that extends out past the wall. Say it. A part of the roof that extends out past the wall. Say it as you write it down. A part of the roof that extends out past the Wall. Second word is fringe. A decorative border or edging of hanging threads attached to a band. Say it. A decorative border or edging of hanging threads attached to a band. Say it. A decorative border or edging of hanging threads attached to a band. Say it as you write it down. 
a decorative, decorative border or edging of hanging threads attached to a band. Okay, next word is a hamo. Hey, we're going to use a two letter a that we do use at the end of English words. Mo, we're going to use ow, oh, cow in the snow, and it is a compound word. Hey, mo. The part of the barn where hay or straw is stored. Say it. The part of the barn where hay or straw is stored. Say it. The part of the barn where hay or straw is stored. Say it as you're writing it down. The part of the barn where hay or straw is stored. And then finally, our last one is hoop skirt. We're going to use ooh, uh, and then skirt. We're going to use er, the er of bird. And it's a compound word, hoop skirt. A long, Full skirt, belled out with a series of connected circular supports. Say it. A long, full skirt, belled out with a series of connected circular supports. Say it. A long, full skirt, belled out with a series of connected circular supports. Say it as you're writing it down. A long full skirt. Belled out with a series of connecting with a series of connecting Hoops or circular supports, circular supports. Circular, that's one of our spelling words. You should be able to spell it, supports, circular supports. Okay, let me see what else we got here. This is our first quote. Father was an important man. He had a good farm. He drove the best horses in that country. His word, county, I'm sorry. His word was as good as his bond, and every year he put money in the bank. When father drove into Malone, all the townspeople spoke to him respectfully. What does that quote tell us about Elmanzo's father? It does. It tells us that he's a very rich man and that he's well-respected. If he says he's going to do something, he does something. He keeps his word. He, he doesn't make um, promises that he cannot keep. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one more quote. Oops, I went too far. Sorry, I'm reading this off of the paper because I didn't print it out when I was at the school. The cold was cruel. The night was black and still. And the stars were tiny sparkles in the sky. Elmanza was glad to get into the big kitchen, warm with fire and candlelight. He was very hungry. We already talked about what the author meant by saying that the cold was cruel. How does this particular quote help us understand how Almanzo is feeling at that moment? It, it's very descriptive. It has a lot of adjectives, and it's it's letting us know that it's really cold and dark outside. And Almanzo, the kitchen, when he went into the kitchen, it was big and it was warm and it was well lit. And also it had all of the lovely smells from the dinner there. And he was really enjoying that. Okay, let's go ahead and write this quote down in our cursive, in, as cursive. We're going to do it in a series of sentences. The cold was cruel. Go ahead and put your quotation marks, your uppercase T. Uh, 
I had to stop and think about what one actually looks like because I make them differently. T H E, the cold was cruel. And we're going to use ooh, you that we do not use at the end of English words cruel. The night was black and still, and then put a comma behind that one. The night was black and still. period, uh, comma, I'm sorry, and then cross your T, dot your I after still. And the stars were tarny sparkles in the sky. And the, remember, take your time to do this. Stars were tiny sparkles in the sky, period. Now another sentence. The night was, oh, we already read that. <laughs> Elmanza was glad to get into the big warm kitchen, comma. Elmanzo was glad to get. Remember that you have to cross your T after you finish the word. Into, and the same with dotting your I's. Into the big, and then after uh, kitchen, big kitchen, right, kitchen, I'm sorry, kitchen. You're going to put a comma after kitchen, the big kitchen, comma, that's where the comma goes, warm with fire and candlelight. Warm with fire and candlelight. And this is another compound word. You need to write the entire word before you go back and cross your T and dot your I, period. It's actually a hyphenated word. I don't think that it is, but in my notes it is, so. He was very hungry. He, remember when you make the H, you make your first stroke, then you lift your pencil up. He, was very hungry. Period. End of quotation mark. Okay, I'm going to show you my notes. If you need to pause the video, oops, let me switch it over so I can actually see what I'm doing. If you need to pause the video so that you can see the notes, and you can check, oh, that's a bad glare. I, you can check your um, cursive against mine. Let me turn off that light. That's leaving a terrible glare. Then uh, go ahead and pause it. Otherwise, just leave the video running. The cursive is what you are really wanting to make sure is proper. When you are finished with that, go ahead and take a copy of this page or pages and submit your notes for a grade in Bright Thinker. You guys have a great day. Bye.